Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christelle Kachiko, and I'll be your webinar facilitator today. It's been quite a while since our last client webinar, so please bear with us if we're just a little bit rusty. I also hope that everyone is keeping safe and sound, especially those in Queensland and New South Wales who are experiencing extreme weather conditions this week. So the reason why we have organised today's webinar is to provide an insight into the current challenges in Australia's landside operations. COVID-19's impact is still being felt across global supply chains and domestically we are tackling labour shortages and as, as mentioned, extreme weather conditions across the country. We hope the information we are sharing today will be helpful in informing and preparing your team for the opportunities and challenges in the weeks ahead. Before I introduce our key speakers and delve into today's session, I'll quickly go through a few housekeeping items. Firstly, please input all your questions on the chat box below and we will go through them during the live Q&A later. Secondly, please take a few moments to complete the feedback survey after the webinar. We do use this feedback mechanism to continuously improve our webinars. Thirdly, a recording of this webinar will be distributed by broadcast to you by the end of this week, so by tomorrow. And lastly, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to get in touch. It's my absolute pleasure to introduce you to our key speakers today. We have Scott Walker, our National Transport Manager here at Mondial VGL Australia. Scott has over 25 years of experience in the Australian wharf cartage industry. He is an active member of the Port Transport Logistics Task Force and the Empty Container Working Group. I'm also so pleased to introduce our second key speaker. We have Neil Chambers, Director at the Container Transport Alliance Australia. CTAA is one of the leading advocacy groups in the Australian container transport industry. Neil is very well known for his advice and advocacy on commercial, regulatory and ind industrial issues impacting the future productivity, safety and viability of the freight industry. So today's agenda will cover a few different items. Firstly, we will do a quick overview of the 2020 to 2021 challenges we've faced to date. We're also going to cover labour shortages, container arrival volumes, terminal congestion, equipment, situation in Melbourne, the weather disruptions we're currently experiencing across Queensland, New South Wales and Victoria, and of course the live Q&A session later on. So a really big welcome to everyone. Let's get started. I'll now pass you on to Scott and Neil, both of whom will provide an update on Australia's landside challenges. Thanks, Christelle. Good afternoon, all, and thanks for joining us today. This webinar is a little overdue. However, my time has been better spent with all transport teams, assisting them with current issues. The webinar was badly needed, so here we are today. My apologies it was not done sooner. My grandfather taught me while growing up, if you have nothing nice to say, don't say anything at all. Unfortunately, I have to go against his wise words today. As much as what I need to talk about is a little negative, and are the current issues creating a congestion crisis within the land side of Australian logistics, there is not much positive in the mix. In 2020, we had the fires, floods, and of course the arrival of COVID and the pandemic. It was a very scary time for us and challenged everything we do in logistics, schooling, shopping, and sports. Everything was affected. We all thought 2021 would be better. Again, we were wrong, and there were a new set of challenges for us to deal with in the logistics space. Blockages at origin, capacity issues with ships, increased costs, and ongoing COVID lockdowns and battles. 2022 arrives, and we all hope we are past the worst. What we had not factored in was Omicron, and the arrival of Omicron could not have come at a worse time. Right when the floodgates had opened on container arrivals into Australia, peak volumes, shorter weeks, labour issues, terminal and empty park issues created the perfect storm for the land side in Australia. As Omicron hit over the Christmas January period, many would remember the empty shelves in supermarkets. What caused these empty shelves was the unbelievable amount of lost workers to COVID and close contacts. This affected us all, from ports, container transport companies, receiving DCs, empty parks, and of course the many line haul and direct-to-store customer deliveries. So whilst a huge volume of containers were arriving, there were backlogs happening in reverse up the chain from DC back to the ports. From these issues in January, the industry had not recovered, in particular in Melbourne. 
Today, I would like to give you an insight into the various issues we are facing, how these issues combined have created a congestion in, in pinch points as bad, if not worse, as I've seen in my 25 years experience in transport. Hi, Scott. Sorry to interrupt you. Do you mind just putting your microphone a little bit closer to your to mouth, please? It's just a, a little bit of um, echoing. The, the audio hasn't been right. very good. Is that all right now? Much better. Cool. On to labour issues. To me, right now, this is the single biggest issue we face. We have struggled for years trying to get enough drivers in trucks and use many strategies to assist with this issue. Right now, this is as bad as I've seen it. I believe there are a few factors creating this issue, which include the mandatory vaccinations and, of course, the lack of immigration in the last two years. As an example, right now in Melbourne, we have over 15 available driver positions and averaging around 10 drivers daily with absenteeism. This ranges from sick leave, annual leave, and of course where COVID impacts us. So at times we're effectively down 25 drivers to do the work. We have on many occasions through this current crisis flown drivers from interstate to Melbourne to assist. This can only be done when the volume allows in other states to do so. I'm sure you will also understand this comes at a large cost of the business and is unsustainable long term. We have significant incentives in play for new drivers and driver referrals, which is having little effect. So if any of you want to refer me a driver directly, we do pay you for it. And given the current crisis, I'm happy to extend this bonus to our customers, especially in Melbourne. The situation is very similar in our warehouses and of course our customer warehouses where the same labour issues are creating problems. Both Neil and I sit on a few government working groups and this has been raised as a key issue. Neil, do you have anything to add in particular around the federal government skilled labour listings for immigration? Thanks very much, Scott, and thanks very much to Mondial VGL for inviting me to be part of today. Um, look, your situation is replicated across the the container transport operators and others in the land side. Uh, we thought that the Omnicon variant would, would start to dissipate and, and we'd see less labour absenteeism, but it's not really uh, the case yet. So anywhere between 10 to 20% of labour shortages still caused by the pandemic. Uh, we work very closely with government, as you know, Scotty, uh, in relation to some of the working groups, uh, particularly in Victoria, to uh, get um, government to allow uh, the return of COVID close contacts uh, to return to work in a safe manner uh, with rapid antigen testing uh, and the like and other uh, criteria around their safe return to work. So that, that's helped to a degree, but we really do still suffer from the labour shortages. Uh, and it's right across the board, including, as you said, the unskilled labour in relation to container pack and unpack um, we put some propositions to both the federal government and, and all state governments. Uh, the driver shortage issue is a longer term structural issue that we're going to continue to need to work on. Uh, but one of the things that's really hurt uh, Australia uh, and our sector particularly has been no migration for the last two years because of the pandemic. Um, so we, we haven't seen that and also uh, student, uh, student visas and the like. So we haven't seen that availability of labour coming through. Uh, and one thing we've certainly put to the federal government through the Productivity Commission review on, uh, on Australia's logistics chains is the fact that truck driver as a skill set is not included on the skills occupation list for migration to Australia. You can uh, Google that if you like, everybody. Uh, type in hairdresser. Hairdressers are considered a, a skill shortage, uh, but yet truck drivers aren't. Um, so that's something that immediately the government could, could review. And I think there needs to be quite a, a, a task undertaken uh, by industry and government uh, to start to attract skilled labour um, uh, from overseas to start to address some of the short to medium term issues we're having with uh, driver shortages particularly. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. You've raised some good points there. On to container arrival volumes. 2021 was a challenge for global logistics. Locally, however, things were a little easier. Due to the global challenges, our arrivals into Australia were down. June to November, we were averaging around 4,500 container deliveries per month. Then December to February, this was just under 9,000 containers. Almost double the container arrivals and deliveries in these months. 
This would be challenging any time to receive this influx. However, we also had to deal with this volume in conjunction with Omicron, the Christmas period, shorter weeks, and of course, the labour issues, which I've already mentioned. This has created significant backlogs and congestion. Not really sure why we received so much volume, but obviously the blockages upstream had finally been released and all those containers at transshipment ports finally made their way to us. Neil, did you have anything to add on this? And are your members experiencing the same industry-wide? Uh, yes, they are, Scott. Um, your figures uh, are replicated across the supply chain. Um, one issue that we've certainly heard is that uh, with Lunar New Year or Chinese New Year, you normally see a slowdown or, or a, a reduction in vessel capacity, so blank sailings and the like. hasn't really occurred this year, and also as the ships have come through the transshipment ports, particularly Singapore, Port Kalang, et cetera, in, in Malaysia, there's been a backlog of those containers uh, um, that are now being uplifted uh, and are coming to Australia all at once. So we're, we're continuing to see part of the high demand with uh, the sweeping up, if you like, of the, the transshipment backlog. Uh, one example uh, uh, was um, a CTA Alliance company uh, that deals with a large uh, um, importer of uh, timber. And instead of receiving, you know, 20 or 30 containers in one shipment, they're about to receive 127 containers in, in one shipment and have to deal with that from a landside logistics point of view. So, so that is certainly uh, contributing to the issues um, and, and all of the large volume carriers like yourselves uh, are really struggling for space uh, in their yards. Uh, yards reported up to 180% capacity. Uh, this produces all sorts of operational constraints and safety related concerns. Um, and uh, as you say, Scott, uh, people are looking for additional places to store both fulls and empties, as the velocity of the movement of the containers through the supply chain is impacted quite severely at the moment. Thanks. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, I'll talk about the uh, terminal issues now. Certainly, we are not the only ones affected by the, the, all the volume and the labour issues. The stevedores and empty parks have experienced similar issues. Some stevedores had to close over this period due to COVID, which created further backlogs. Uh, waiting times have increased to be processed for containers, Every day we are also struggling to gain the required time slots to pick containers up from the port and also the same struggle in trying to dehire containers. In all states, this has meant we are too often less stockpiling empties and we cannot dehire. The lack of availability of slots often means we are focusing on clearing containers which are close to storage rather than being able to pick up containers and expedite them for delivery. Some recent news out of Fremantle is that from the week commencing the 9th of March, the following four weeks will see 15 vessels arrive into Fremantle, 13 of these calling DP World and only two Patricks. We have been advised that these arrivals have very large exchanges on them, so significant volume will hit. This is all happening as the WA COVID cases spike. I expect the congestion issues in WA to worsen. On a positive note regarding the ports, I can confirm that during all this, Patrick's and MUA finally settled on an enterprise agreement. So for now, we should not have any major industrial issues with stevedores. Maybe some tugboat issues, but that's another story. With this influx of containers, we've also experienced our own congestion in our own sites. These capacity issues instantly slow down operations, in turn affecting timely deliveries. It is not unusual at the moment to be holding 100 plus containers for a customer. This can be as high as 250 to 300 containers. This is putting significant pressure on our operations and equipment. In Melbourne alone, we have such a large holding of containers that both our own two facilities are full and we are utilising another five sites to store containers. Yes, five. This adds to an already strained supply chain and significantly reduces our capacity to operate effectively. And we are left at the mercy of other facilities on when we will or won't be loaded and also what containers can be made available to us. We continue to push as many deliveries as we can to reduce our container holding and get as many containers out as possible. Neil, what's your take on that? Look, from an industry point of view, uh, Scott, if you put the COVID-related issues aside, and, and, and that will eventually resolve itself. 
we, we continue to have the high demand, but some of the, there's some structural changes that have occurred in the industry and they will continue and we've got to be able to deal with it into the future. Uh, and, and one is the size of vessels. So there are relatively less vessels coming, but they're larger. So, of course, when they arrive, their discharge and load ratio is, is much larger. Uh, and at the moment, of course, with the birth uh, reliability, birthing reliability and vessel scheduling being you know, pretty much shot because of the high volumes and global um, global uh, 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 concerns with uh, supply chain, um, we're, we're getting vessel bunching. So all of a sudden you've got these quite large vessels, larger than they've ever been in the past, big exchanges, particularly import discharges, all coming together either at once in the one terminal or uh, one on top of each other. You're still only, as a transport operator working for your customers, you're still only getting three days to clear those containers from, from the wharf. Uh, and, of course, you, the, the export receivables are, are thrown into disarray with the changes in the vessel schedules as well. So we call that the tsunami effect. It's, it's the lumpy volumes that landside logistics stakeholders have to deal with. It is contributing significantly to the current uh, congestion and, and uh, delays landside, uh, but... Once Omicron is gone and the pandemic's over, hopefully um, it, we will still be faced with this issue and we're going to need to work very closely with the terminals and, and every other stakeholder and governments to ensure that we start to get a bit smarter about the way we're actually dealing with the interface with, with the wharf. Thanks, mate. Uh, On to uh, some equipment fundamentals and issues. We invest very heavily every year in new equipment, which includes new reach stackers, new trucks, new trailers, new sites from time to time. We run one of the most modern fleets on the Australian waterfront. waterfront. This also includes the cleanest, with more than 95% of trucks Euro 5 or Euro 6 compliant, which means our fleet meets the highest of global emission standards. Unfortunately, even with a modern fleet, we are susceptible to breakdowns. We continue to work around the clock and attempt to catch up and get as many deliveries executed as possible. In the last couple of weeks, we have seen some significant breakdowns of our reach stackers and container forks. This equipment works around the clock. When these machines break down for any reason, it has major impacts to the flow of containers and can even halt our own terminal operations. We've had some extended breakdowns in recent weeks, in particular with these machines in Sydney, Melbourne and Fremantle. These breakdowns have contributed to further congestion at these times. All machines are currently operationally nationally, which is good news. However, the breakdowns we had in recent weeks did cause significant delays. Keeping these machines operational is imperative. However, they are also susceptible to the current crisis. We need to have the parts available and due to ongoing supply chain issues, often the parts are not available or take longer than normal to receive. Also, the mechanics responsible for maintaining and repairing these machines are also in short supply, similarly to our own fleet of drivers. We cannot simply just add equipment or replace either. In general, equipment is not available to buy or rent. Many suppliers of trucks in this country are no longer taking orders for new trucks, as their current order book is more than two years out. Trailers we would norm normally order take six to eight weeks to be made and delivered. This is now well over nine months and more. Neil, have you got anything to add in this area? Yeah, thanks, Scott. Look, at the industry level, and maybe I'm just getting old and crusty, but I'm certainly seeing more equipment maintenance issues and IT-related glitches uh, in the supply chain generally, including at Stevedore terminals. Um, and there needs to be greater investment to improve redundancy in the capacity so there's different terminal uh, equipment types, as everyone probably realises, uh, particularly in uh, on the East Coast where each of the ports have automatic stacking crane operations like VICT in Melbourne or Hutchison uh, in Sydney and, and Brisbane and, of course, DP World in Brisbane as well. Um, and, of course, once one of those machines goes down in a module or block, as they call them, uh, then containers are stuck in, in, in that module until such time as the machine's repaired. Um, of course, your customers, Scotty, probably don't see all the work that your transport team does to try and reschedule slots that are, um, are having to be cancelled because they can't get into that particular block uh, within the terminal uh, or there's been a, uh, 
a, an IT glitch in, in some other form, or there's been numerous times where terminals have had outages where they've had to reboot IT systems and the like. So we're very reliant on technology now, but we've got to, again, continue to work with the stupidors, particularly to ensure that we're getting the right investment uh, uh, so that uh, we're minimising the impact of, of these types of delays. And, and when it does uh, happen, of course, it can be quite uh, significant in terms of whether you can get those containers or, or, or receive exports in time for vessel cutoff. So it's an important issue. Thanks, Scotty. Thanks, Neil. Um, we'll talk a little bit about now your hometown. Uh, whilst all of these issues discussed today are national issues, uh, different states are managing and getting by a little different. In Melbourne, they seem to be worst affected in the labour terminal congestion space. As mentioned, we are in need of more than 15 drivers and daily seeing absenteeism averaging 10 per day. We are currently holding over a 1,000 containers at the various sites we are operating from. Our normal container holding would be three to 400 containers, not 1,000. Melbourne is also seeing very large road infrastructure projects. This is seeing trip times moving from the port to our sites and other delivery points, seeing trip times increase by 80 minutes for a round trip. This effectively reduces our capacity significantly every day. Today alone, there were several major road incidents, uh, incidents on top of the normal roadworks. This saw traffic banked up all over Melbourne, including outside our Altona site, where we were unable to even leave our terminal without sitting in a traffic jam. Neil, you're based in Melbourne. What wall can you add on this? And can you also talk more about the working, working group that we're sitting on that the uh, Melbourne government have put together? Thanks, Scott. At the moment, I try to avoid getting in the car and trying to uh, go in and out of Melbourne, I've got to say. And today was a, a classic example where uh, my understanding with one of the one of the concerns was that the CFMEU, the union, uh, had an argument with the uh, one of the road constructors and uh, the Williamstown Road area, if people are familiar with that, in uh, getting onto the M1, the Westgate Freeway, uh, was completely blocked uh, coming into peak. So, so that caused uh, traffic chaos. Yes, we understand the Victorian government needs to undertake these big build projects, uh, but they've been going on for a very long time and there needs to be an appreciation of what it, what the impacts it's having on, on freight movements, particularly out of the west, um, but also out of the southeast, down in Ong, Hallam uh, direction and from the north as well. So they're all over Melbourne. Uh, it's, in, it's increasing travel times uh, by 45 minutes to an hour, so you're getting less turns of the truck. You're in the potential to miss time slots into the wharf or miss customer delivery uh, time windows, um, and it's a real challenge uh, at the moment. One other transport operator explained to me that it, it's effectively taken 30% of their, their transport capacity away by trucks being stuck uh, in, in traffic jams and, and congestion. Um, not a sh no short answer to all of this from, from the government's point of view, but we're certainly working, as you said, uh, Scotty, with both the minister and, and a working group that's been established by Freight Victoria to really look at some of these issues. What can we do both in the medium term and what's some of the longer term structural issues that we, we need to deal with? Um, certainly, we're also finding that empty containers aren't being evacuated at a quick enough rate in Melbourne at the moment. So we're looking at the load discharge ratio, as they call it. So how many import containers full and empty came in in one month and how many export containers went out em empty and full in a month. And for the last seven to eight months, we've been in negative territory, which means that uh, empty containers are building up uh, in the system. Now, that in itself uh, creates congestion with the empty container parks. My calculation was that something like 50,000 20-foot equivalent units to use uh, in empties are, are surplus at the moment in, in the system, let alone all the other uh, containers that are coming into the country and, and, and coming back as empty and this is leading to you, Scott, and, and other transport operators having more empties in your yard, the inability to, 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 uh, to de-hire those, uh, that, that's adding to congestion. So one thing that could happen quite quickly is the shipping lines to really start looking again, as we've done at other times in the pandemic, about how we, how we get the evacuation of the empty containers up uh, in, in not just Melbourne, but uh, every port. Yeah, that's uh, the empties are certainly a national issue, and I see that only getting worse as as the more containers get delivered, and even our own FCL storage lowers, the empty pinch point is going to become 
critical um, as we go forward. Thanks for that, Neil. Uh, on to a more recent issue that we have, uh, the floods and the weather. Uh, you'd all be aware of the current flooding issues in and around southeast Queensland and New South Wales, and also now blocking supply of roads and rail between New South Wales and Queensland. The situation is still very dynamic. The Brisbane port remains closed to any vessel leaving or arriving, and we have now picked up all containers from the port. Uh, we do hope the port opens soon to vessels and normal operations, although further downpours today in Brisbane could delay this further. Uh, we are aware that a couple of tankers have been allowed to berth. Um, hopefully container ships will be next. Uh, our Brisbane team is in a good position uh, to handle the work when the port reopens. Uh, we don't expect any long-term implications as we fire up and return to normal services. We were in a very good position going into the, the floods and the weather crisis in Brisbane and expect to catch up very quickly. Uh, I certainly wish all our customers and staff well in Brisbane and hope they are all safe and well. Um, Sydney is now also being affected by serious flooding and inclement weather. Um, this has increased some absenteeism for our transport fleet here in Sydney. Uh, however, at this stage, it is having minimal, minimal effect on operations. We do hope this continues. We have seen a, a delay in some of the ships that were due in this morning, haven't arrived as yet so we are concerned that due to the swells maybe uh the port or the pilots can't get on or off the ships but we're still hoping some of the the big boats that are due in today will still arrive um neil you got anything else to add on this oh just on brisbane it uh, it, it hasn't got any better yet um the concern really is the debris coming down the the, the, the brisbane river ending up in the port uh, channel and swing basin areas so uh the regional harbour Master is, is working very closely with the Port of Brisbane uh, and all stakeholders to, to look at when you can uh, start vessel movements again. They did need to get a, a tanker off the Ampol berth and a, another tanker on, and that was simply to maintain fuel supplies uh, for the region. So um, it's a dangerous situation at the moment. Um, you mentioned imports. Uh, terminals are encouraging people to get the imports off if you haven't done so already, and you, you seemingly have. But, of course, they've also suspended export operations. So there's no export receivables uh, into the terminals at the moment. So everything really is at a standstill, uh, which is very unusual, and we just hope that everyone is safe and that the, the river levels and debris uh, are cleaned up as, as soon as possible. Thanks, Neil. That's pretty much it for today until we uh, jump to a Q&A. But before we do, I just wanted to, to thank, take this time to thank all our customers for their ongoing support over the last few years. It is great to partner with you all and constantly evolve to find solutions, especially in the crazy world we now live. I also wanted to highlight and thank the entire Mondial VGL team, and in particular our transport and warehouse operations, most of which were never able to work from home, came to work day in and day out, and kept our operations going. I've seen some absolute heroic and gargantuan efforts over the last two years, and I thank the team for the commitment and resilience in what we do day in and day out for our valued customers. Now over to you, Crystal. I believe you've got some Q&A for us. Thanks, Scott and Neil, on to our Q&A session. Uh, we, we did receive a few questions during the registration phase, which we will address first. So in the meantime, please feel free to input your questions in the Q&A chat box below, and we will endeavour to respond to them live. So our first question is from David. He's asking, when do you anticipate for things to get back to normal? Don't we all want to know that? Yes, I might take that and get my crystal ball out, to uh, Christelle. Uh, <laughs> If you, if you read some of the really good international um, experts uh, in the global situation, and, and, and what I'm thinking of is a guy called Lars Jensen, and in fact, in the chat, if, if uh, participants go to the chat room, I've put a link uh, to a, a LinkedIn um, uh, article that, that Lars has done. It's actually a film of him wrapping up a conference in the United States recently on, on some of the issues globally. And I think it's compulsory viewing. Um, he's independent uh, uh, from either the sh uh, ship operators or, or the land side. So you get a very uh, good indication from him as to, to what the circumstance is. And he's looked back over the statistics of when we've had these shocks previously, such as uh, in the financial crisis uh, and, and in other points in time. And it would take, in his view, at least 18 months for any return to normal operations and 
the question then becomes, what is the new normal? So freight rates uh, are not expected to reduce. Uh, he also makes the point, which again is a structural issue, that uh, now we have the top 10 container transport ship operators controlling 85% of world container trade. Now, they're not about to go into the boom and bust cycle that, they've, they've, that, that, that has happened previously, and they're not about to cut each other's throats, I wouldn't imagine, on, on freight rates. So the freight rates will stay high. They may come off the boil a little bit from their current really unprecedented highs, but it's not likely that they will return to something pre-COVID. Uh, and then the port congestion, and one of the issues, of course, is that China still has a zero tolerance approach to COVID. So you're one case of COVID away from Shanghai or Ningbo or Gantian or somewhere else closing down. Uh, and, and that's a real threat and a real risk uh, uh, to, to all um, uh, trade lanes. Um, so, yeah, please go and, go and have a look at that. I, I don't know when it will. I think that for the rest of this year, at least, we're going to continue to see these high volumes. We certainly haven't seen um, the volumes coming off the boil to a large degree at this point in time. Um, and as I say, we're, we're struggling with all these other uh, issues which are affecting congestion, both in terms of the berthing of the ships and also right through the land side. Thank you, Neil. Um, as Neil mentioned, uh, if you'd like to watch that recording of Lars's presentation, um, Neil did share the link at the very beginning of the, the chat box. Um, either way, we're probably going to also share that during the when we, sp um, we distribute the recording in the copy of this presentation by tomorrow. Thanks again, Neil. Our next question is from Rod. Um, he's asking, please provide an update on the union movement and likely issues going forward. We did touch a little bit on this early in the early in the presentation, but if you have anything else to add, Neil, please please go ahead. Yes, well, Scott did mention that the the Patrick terminals and the MUA have finally uh, agreed on uh, enterprise agreement terms, uh, both at a national level and individually in each of the terminals, still being ratified, as I understand it, by the Fair Work Commission. Um, that puts to bed the latest enterprise agreements for each of the stevedore terminals uh, in Australia. Now, as, as uh, Scott said, you would hope that that delivers some form of uh, industrial harmony uh, over the next three to three to four years, um, but anything's possible. Um, there's still a dispute uh, between um, all of the maritime unions and uh, Spitzer, the tug operator. Um, thankfully, though, in most ports, there's uh, multiple tug operations and uh, if there's any delays with Spitzer, perhaps some of the other uh, tug operators can, can step into the breach. Um, so hopefully we're, 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 we're over some of those issues, um, but of course, never say never. And we just have to continue to, to work with the stevedores to improve the productivity levels, so continue to improve the productivity levels through the, through the terminals. Thank you, Neil. Our next question is from Chris. What can we do to minimise detention charges in the face Port biosecurity and fumigation delays. Uh, look, that is a real difficult one because I think as we've talked about today, there's so much that you, you don't have control of, we don't have control of. And in the in the global shipping crisis, the, the shipping lines have also put the squeeze on detention periods and the allowed time. Look, the best thing I guess I can suggest is make sure before your shipment arrives is make sure all paperwork is in check so it can be processed, there's no delays. Uh, we often do have that issue. So to me, that would be the fundamental, uh, but it is a challenging period right now um, in that space. So, yes. Crystal, I'll just, I'll just chip in and say, look at a longer term level to the likes of CTAA and other organisations such as Freight and Trade Alliance, the Australian Peak Shippers Association of others, have made the point to governments that um, we really need to follow the lead of the United States uh, and the, the, the Federal Maritime Commission over in the United States, which has come up with an interpretive rule around both what we would call container storage, that they call demurrage, and, and container detention. And some of the principles that are in there, I think, need to be applied in the Australian context, and that is, what is the reasonableness of container detention, particularly in the, in the face of um, not being physically able to return the container in, in the time period because of a factor such as the empty container park not being open or, you know, on weekends or, or, or some aren't open uh, 24 hours a day uh, or they're so congested that Scott and his team can't get a, a slot for love nor money for the next uh, 24 to 48 hours or uh, a technical point, containers are more and more redirected. Um, so the shipping line will say take this container back to 
container park ABC, and then they'll change their mind and say, no, no, now we want it to re be returned, say, direct to Wharf. Now, for Scott's team, that means potentially cancelling a slot that they've already uh, um, got for an empty container park, trying to rebook the slot, say, into the terminal. There's a natural delay, time delay in that, and sometimes we've seen container detention being issued um, because that time lag has led to that. Now, would any reasonable person say that's a reasonable outcome? And, and the answer would be no, but we need a regulatory authority like the ACCC to come up with similar interpretive rules and then have some way in which uh, these sorts of contract disputes between the importer and the shipping line can be can be heard fairly based on some regulation in Australia. Uh, we have another question from Chris. He's asking, how do we minimise the impact of uh, issues on priority containers? That that's a, is a difficult one to answer because I don't quite know exactly what you're talking about, but there's a few factors there. If you're talking, yeah, the order of containers that you receive and making sure your urgent one's coming through our facilities the quickest possible way and getting the right container. What I've mentioned in Melbourne is obviously uh, a real problem and it is very difficult for our team uh, to keep control when we're using five external facilities to store containers. So while we've got a thousand containers that we're holding onto, it is very difficult. In other states too, whilst we're not using the same externals, our facilities are at capacity and quite full. Uh, so the big one we always push is knowing when the container comes or at ETA of the container, knowing when you want that container is critical, um, knowing that you want that in two or three days' time and we can organise our terminals accordingly to then make sure that is delivered uh, in the right order to you. That is probably the best way I think I can answer that one from a land side perspective. Thanks, Scott. Um, I do have a question from Jared that is quite uh, related to that question because you mentioned that we are at capacity in our site. He's asking what container capacity are in our yards, um, just to give like our audience a bit of a context as to how much containers we actually do have in our yards. In our very own terminals, oh, I can't answer that offhand, it's different in each state. It also varies on the mix of containers we're holding. So where we could potentially, where we've got a lot of empties, we can block stack a lot of empties from time to time and that increases our uh, capacity levels. Uh, then if we've got lots of smaller, shorter stacks arranging deliveries for and uh, day-to-day clients, it reduces our capacity in the yard. So it is very different in in each um, site, in each state, and in particular each day. Uh, we have had in our facilities over 2,000 containers. And in Altona and Dandenong, which I think is where you're, you potentially might be talking about, uh, between the two sites, we can hold about 400 containers. And Crystal, just imagine if transport operators like Mondial VGL, Ford or N transport operator and all the other transport operators haven't invested a huge amount of money in the landside facilities that they, at the yards, the, the people, um, the technology to make those tick over. The whole system in Australia works because effectively Mondial VGL's yards uh, and everyone else, they're satellite terminals. Our terminals are relatively small in comparison to world uh, terminals. And of course, it's all about velocity for the container terminals here. Get the containers away when they come off the ship as import and receive the exports at the last minute so they can be loaded onto the, onto the ship and not clag up um, the terminal. So without the investment that transport operators have, have undertaken, massive when you think about it from your company's point of view, you know, take Sydney with Banks Meadow and Erskine Park and, and Queensland and here in Melbourne, the, the whole thing would be multiple times worse. Uh, and I, I don't think enough credit's given to the transport operators for that level of investment that's gone on and continues to need to be to, to be done. And one thing, again, we're pointing out to, to governments, including through this working group that Scott mentioned in Victoria, is that the cost of developing those sites now, even in outer suburban areas, is quite extraordinary because the cost of land and the cost of construction and also some of the government regulations around um, uh, around the way these sites need to be to be developed uh, is really expensive, and so that's just got to be appreciated as we go forward and the volumes continue to grow. And even to confirm what you're saying there, Neil, as one of the larger carriers in Australia, our KPI with the port to get the access that we do is all about dwell time on the port. So the second the container hits the ground on the quayside. They want us to move it and we're measured in that regard. So that just highlights what you're saying. Thank you both. Our next question is from Lee. 
Um, they're asking, can you please provide the latest fumigation processing time in each state? It does vary in every state. So I'll just quickly run through each state. Um, Sydney's in a really good position at the moment. You're looking at two to three, sometimes four days, and that includes gas and release. Uh, Melbourne, it's taking, uh, due to the congestion down there, anything from six to eight days to get through the pad and gas. Uh, then it's another 48 to 72 hours to actually get that clearance. Uh, Brisbane, similarly, it's about six days to run through the gas, get it through the pad and uh, gas, then again, 72 hours for um, clearance. Perth is very similar to Brisbane and Adelaide is about four to five days from ETA to right through for the process. Thanks, Scott. Our next question is from Vanessa. Um, Adrian also just posted a question that's very similar, so we'll just answer them both at the same time. What is the response from the shipping lines to these domestic challenges that we are having? Is this something you can help us with, Neil? Um, yeah, look, we're in communication with the shipping lines. Uh, of course, their focus is on getting ships alongside discharging cargo, uploading cargo, and getting ships back to see where they make money. It's a little bit like Scott. The truck doesn't make any money if it's stuck in a queue or uh, is not loaded uh, with a productive uh, cargo. So that, that's the focus of the shipping lines. Um, they would say, and they're probably right, that a lot of the global constraints and, and congestion haven't been caused necessarily by them. It's a whole bunch of other factors. Certainly, there's another question in the chat that I've, I've noticed, which is similar, Christelle, which is, are the shipping lines taking responsibility for evacuation of the empties, for example? Um, and the answer is complex, but probably yes. They don't want their containers to be languishing here when they can get them back to Asia or another part of the globe where they can make money, they can generate more revenue. That's that's what they're in the business of doing, and they're doing that very successfully at the moment. Um, but um, um, people have also got to appreciate that, again, it's these larger vessels when the larger vessels come in, um, the stevedore contracts with the shipping lines tend to have an a, um, exchange cap, you know, which might be, say, 3,500 TU exchange. If you get 2,000 TU or more offers imports and you can only load 1,500, both full exports and empties, you're clearly not keeping pace with the, with the amount of, uh, of import uh, cargo. Naturally, you're getting this surplus increase. The shipping lines then have to have conversations with the stevedores about, okay, can we stay alongside for a little bit longer and we'll upload, you know, X number of empties. And, of course, that becomes difficult with the berth congestion because the next ship for another customer of the stevedore is waiting to come alongside. So there's this constant uh, struggle to to get the, the upload um, of the empties. Uh, and we've also seen, again, because of the labour shortages, the unavailability of truck drivers to do the bulk runs, as we call it. So when the ship calls for two, 300 containers alongside the load, you've got to bring those from the empty container parks and other facilities. And if you don't have the labour to do that or it's there's congestion, um, it causes that those bulk runs not to be completely fulfilled. So it, there's a lot of issues. Who thought that moving bits of steel around was so difficult? But it, it, it is. Um, I think the shipping lines certainly do need to, particularly in Melbourne, uh, do need to concentrate very much on uh, the evacuation of the empty so that we can keep the capacity of the empty component parks at a manageable level. Thank you, Neil. Uh, I do have another question for you. It's from Matthew. He's asking, will an increased investment in uptake and automation help ease the infrastructure congestion and labour challenges we're facing right now? Um, is, is this being undertaken as an indus industry-wide solution through increased collaboration in the industry? I, I think longer-term automation is inevitable, Christelle, but um, certainly part of the industrial disputation that's gone on recently and it, why it took so long for some of these enterprise agreements with the stevedores to be finalised is that the Labor representatives are saying no, well, not completely no, but no to... To mass automation, and you can see it from 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 their point of view. But there's there's got to be there's got to be a balance um, on the land side. You know what automation are we talking about? I, I think we're quite some time away from automated trucks, for example. Um, so and, and you're, you're still going to need people. In the end of the day, this is a people business. Yes, we use a lot of big bits of kit, ships, trucks, reach stackers, and the like. 
Um, but it is a it is a people industry, and and the operational connections are so important, and it's got so many moving parts to it with containerization that automation um, will will be effective in certain areas. Certainly, one thing that we really do need, though, if you want to call this um, allied to automation, is the better exchange of data. We're still not really good at exchanging data and, and increasing the velocity of the movement of the freight by better exchange of data. And that's because some of the systems still don't talk to each other all that well. And one example, I don't want to necessarily pick on the shipping lines, is that they don't provide the necessary data, particularly on things like empty container dehire location. Um, and so in the transport industry, we're still stuck in the 19th century of sometimes having to take a piece of paper, paper, for God's sake, you know, remember paper where you wrote down stuff, um, and, and take that to an empty container park to verify that this container that's on the back of the truck is actually supposed to come to that facility because the shipping line hasn't provided that information through the technology systems that we have, which would be so much better utilised if we had that information up front. So that's an example. Um, uh, and, you know, we've just got to pick all of those issues and keep hammering away on them and trying to get some improvements. Thank you, Neil. We have a question from Peter um, in relation to the driver shortages that we're having at the moment. Do you both have any idea of when the situation will improve in terms of being able to actually hire a lot more drivers, like availability of drivers in the nation? I would just say perhaps we could do a whole additional webinar on, on skill shortages, to be honest, <laughs> and, and, and the things that need to go on to, uh, to, to address the situation. But the driver shortages has been on the horizon for a long time. Um, it comes all the way to things like uh, industry image. Um, uh, it is a dangerous industry overall. Containerization is a bit different because you're not um, handling the freight directly as, as the truck driver, and that's why we said or we didn't mention that in the, in the when we're on the slide. Um, that ninety three percent of truck drivers are male, only three percent are female. And in container transport, there's no physical activity from, from the driver except for getting in and out of the cab and doing up and undoing twist locks. Um, so we should, what are we doing wrong to not attract 50% of the potential workforce um, a, a, as in females into the industry? Um, that, that's one aspect. Skills migration is, is certainly another one. Uh, and then there's also a proposal out there for heavy vehicle driver apprenticeship uh, that in and of itself is fine, um, but what we need to do too is work with the licensing authorities to ensure that we can train, competently, competently based train and assess driver candidates and get them through what we call a graduated licensing, licensing system more effectively. Uh, because at the moment, if you and I go and get a heavy vehicle licence, we'll, we'll get it at the rigid end of the market, so medium rigid, heavy rigid. And, of course, in our sector of the industry, there's very little work for a rigid truck. Um, it's all at semi-trailer and multi-combination level. Um, and so to progress through those licensing arrangements with better competency-based training and assessment, I think, is part of it. But that is a massive regulatory discussion with the licensing authorities, which are all state-based licensing authorities at this point in time. The National Heavy Vehicle Regulator hasn't taken over that responsibility yet for driver for driver room um, licensing oh, and we could talk all day about this Christelle, but I'm, I'm conscious of time thanks neil well that is a good point um it is 2 51 so we'll probably finish up at three o'clock um but we'll just run through a few more questions that's been um posted on um we got an, a question from sammy perhaps this is something you can help us with thought so they're saying that you know in the context of the challenges we are facing in the industry right now what is on the rvgel doing in terms of the control of the elements that we can control Look, I think uh, firstly we do. We're looking for drivers. We are uh, daily trying to to get drivers. We are offering uh, substantial sign-on bonuses, and these are to the tune of a few thousand dollars. Um, I did talk about in the, the webinar about flying drivers around uh, the countryside. Uh, that obviously has its limitations as well because I can't uh, steal from Brisbane or Sydney and send to Melbourne every week. Um, 
because obviously I've got to be co- we've got to be conscious that we could do just as much damage to another uh, transport division. Uh, so we are working through different things. We're trying to increase. We do have more equipment turning up over the next few weeks, which has included uh, a lot more trailers into our fleet. Um, we've got more reach stackers arriving over the next uh, couple of months. These reach stackers we ordered 18 months ago. Um, we've also um, we've onboarded quite a few subcontractors as we've been able to find them just to bolster our ability uh, to service our customers and, and get through the volume of work. Obviously, we've already done a lot, increased yard capacity, using external facilities. Uh, we hired generators for reefer containers. Um, it does. It is an operation that we're trying to improve around the clock. Great. Thank you, Scott. Uh, a question from Chris. They're asking, with the ongoing battle to balance service and cost, what's your best advice um, that you can provide customers on managing these? Scotty, you, Scotty you're going to take that? I'd, I'd say communication, communication, communication. Yeah, it's a good one. Look, it is a very difficult space right now. We we are obviously struggling, and that's why we've we've put the webinar together today to explain all the different factors. Uh, it's all about what you can control, and from my perspective, it is about making sure when – when goods arrive, we've got access to all the relevant paperwork. There's no problems uh, in that particular space. That helps uh, way down the chain uh, once it does get to the transport team's desk to be able to process um, and action containers as quickly as possible. Uh, that is the, the best way and, and couldn't agree more with Neil's comments, I guess, communication, communication and communication. I certainly know that that's an area we also need to improve at our end and we are working on uh, factors in that space, including nationalising some of our uh, customer service positions to just help, in particular where Melbourne has struggled uh, in the last few months more than, say, some of the others, and I don't want to pick on them, where it has been a national issue. Um, but we have put some strategies in place to assist that uh, customer service piece as well. Thanks, and I suppose, Chris Tellett, I suppose, Chris Tellett, one thing Scotty said was that on our VGL, when import containers come in, are trying to get the container first day of availability or even zero day of availability when it's discharged. You can't do that unless the customer's done all the things necessary to clear that, that container for delivery. Um, uh, and so, you know, it, it is about that pre-planning and working with Scotty's team around making sure that you can get that container as soon as it's landed and as soon as the, the transport team can can get a slot and get in there and get it for you. So it's that prior planning and just an understanding of what Scotty's team actually has to do uh, to make it work for their customers. Yeah. And if I can add to there, you know, I've talked about that paperwork, you know, what the customer can do. It's about the paperwork. The delays with the government agencies right now are significant because of uh, the, the, the congestion, the volume of containers that arrived, BMSB, um, we have significant delays in dealing with the agencies at the moment, and so that is paramount to help us. Great. Thank you. Thanks, both. Um, we've got a, we received a question from Aileen, and perhaps this question is something that you're going to be very happy about. Scotty, um, she, they're asking, can you advise how I can refer MC drivers? Um, yep, I'll certainly, Christelle, I'm sure you have. Um, I hope they're in Melbourne, Aileen. Um, <laughs> Because we'll be talking as about five minutes after the webinar. I'm sure we've got your contact details from your registration, which uh, Crystal will share with me and we'll be talking soon. Yes. So thank if, you for listening. Yes. If anyone else also has any referrals for that, please do let us know. We'd be happy to give you a bit more information about a referral program at the moment. I just thought about thought about a, a nice little learner for CTAA. I should start a referral business, shouldn't I? Just take take the profits. That would be a great take idea. It, take it easy, Neil. <laughs> <laughs> you might not be invited back. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's too good. We'll always have Neil back. We received a question from Andy. Um, he's asking about the situation in USA. Unfortunately, this, this webinar is focused on Australia landside issues. So, Andy, um, I've, we've got your details um, and we'll be in touch with information about the situation in USA um, and we'll take it offline. So, please uh, wait for a response. We'll email you. Probably one from Peter at the end there, Crystal, asking about um, ETA of containers. It was two to three weeks. Then the con- last minute, the vessel was different. I'm assuming 
from Peter's perspective, the background of that is probably a transshipment container. Um, uh, Peter probably needs to just uh, let us know a bit more about that. But that's the issue I spoke about in in the webinar, and that is the transshipment ves vessels are. Um, they're really trying to clear a lot of the backlog. There's a lot of chopping and changing, I would have thought, on, on schedules to upload those containers in their final leg of the journey, down, say, down, down to Australia. So I would assume that that's what's going on, and that's why it's, a, it's, a pretty, uh, it's in flux, uh, particularly from the shipping line's point of view. Thanks, Neil. And, and Peter, I will also get your um, care account manager or your customer service representative to give you a bit more information about that. Um, outside of the webinar. Yeah, and Rahul, I've seen your messages that you'd like more information on the USA situation as well. We'll get in touch to provide that to you offline. Um, I think the last, last question that we'll tackle for today is from Knives. Um, they're asking, we are experiencing huge backlog of quarantine inspections of containers. Can you comment on reasons and, and if anything can be done to improve the rate of inspections? It's everything that we've already talked uh, today about, Nevis. Um, it's everything, really, that, you know, it's the volume arriving. It is, a, you know, the government agency we would, could potentially say they, they don't budget well enough um, in this particular area to to process clearances and do the inspections. So it is, it's everything that we talked about today, COVID, volume, but from the agency side of things, it's, um, yeah, I think uh, Neil and uh, his counterparts at FTA will often talk about um, a lack of budget and uh, not enough people on the ground. You know, they want to stop everything for an inspection, but then they haven't invested well enough. And obviously these government agencies don't understand the true cost of what actually comes of a, you know, an inspection, us taking seven to 10 to 14 days to book an inspection in. Well, I know, Scotty, as you answered before, that you you do your own FUMO and, and, and the like for your customers. But if you're just talking about other fumigation services, I spoke to a very large one, for instance, in Sydney, which is having some difficulty with capacity. Um, they would normally have six to seven biosecurity officers on site every day. That day I spoke to him, they had one inspector, inspector and a trainee. So, and, and that's because of labour uh, shortages uh, within the biosecurity service, again, caused by, by COVID. So they're struggling for staff, but you do have some archaic uh, methods of work, so to speak. Uh, you know, if there's a complete unpack of uh, ordered for the container, the bio the biosecurity officer has to stand and watch the container completely be unpacked. Can't go off and do anything else. You know, you would think that you'd be able to authorise someone from the facility to actually deputise to, to watch that container be unpacked while the biosecurity goes off and does a tail rural tailgate or, or something else. And then another uh, just a war story, I suppose, was a piece of machinery being unpacked, clearly completely dirty, clearly needed to be corrected for um, quarantine wash. Um, but the biosecurity inspector said, oh, no, no, we'll have to wait for the machinery inspector to look at that. There's some uh, methods of work which I think need to be addressed. And I certainly know that our counterparts at places like Freight Trade Alliance work very closely with um, the biosecurity, um, home affairs and the like uh, to, to, to really deal with those issues longer term. But, you know, there are some structural issues that need to be addressed there too. Yeah. And if I can quickly add too, because you do talk about archaic processes, Mondial VGL were the, the first to offer an online IFIP inspection. So if you are uh, eligible in that space, we can often get a booking uh, within about 24 to 36 hours. If it is in that space that is compliant under a, um, we use tablets and FaceTime basically is my understanding to c conduct an inspection, which means the uh, inspectors, instead of driving all over Sydney doing these in person, are, are sitting at a desk and can knock them over a lot quicker. It won't suit uh, every inspection, obviously, but it may get some advantages. So please speak to your broker or your uh, Key account manager who might be able to assist whether you, you fall into that space. Scott, while you're on while you're on quarantine, there's a question in there that came through about China being added to the BMSB list and and what impact that will have. Hold on to your seats, probably the answer. <laughs> Hopefully not this season. We can get ready for it. So, but yeah, what I think that's the right watch this space. Um, our facilities are in a pretty good position uh, at the moment. So as far as turning around and as. Neil mentioned there are sites that in Sydney have closed for fumigation. They're the biggest, the two biggest in Sydney have closed. So they're not accepting any more work uh, until they catch up. So 
Um, we're in a pretty good position in that space. I don't think I want to add all the China volume, but it will see what happens. Amazing. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you both. Um, Terry, we'll probably reach out to you offline as well to give you a little bit more information about the China um, being added to the BMSB list. Uh, we'll be in touch. I think that's it for today. We're out of time. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us. Uh, and please don't hesitate to get in touch if you have any other questions or concerns. As always, we are here to help. As Scott mentioned today, our team will be working around the clock to facilitate pickup and deliveries, and we will do our absolute best given the challenging circumstances that we are facing right now. Have a great afternoon, everyone. Thanks again. See you next time.